Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Washington Brief for Tuesday, June 6. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Jenkins, president of the Washington Times Foundation, which sponsors this webcast. Dr. Jenkins is also chairman of the Washington Times Holdings, the LLC that owns the Times News Organization. He has led many successful fact-finding trips to Korea for policy experts and peace initiatives to the Middle East for the Universal Peace Federation. Dr. Jenkins, welcome. Thank you, Larry, and thank you for all you do for the Washington Brief. I wanna welcome our audience today from all over the world. Today, we're going to focus on North Korea and human rights, and we are really blessed to have uh, the top experts on this issue and many other issues for Northeast Asia. Our guest panelist today is Dr. Katrina Lantos-Sweat. Dr. Sweat serves as president of the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice, established in 2008 to continue the legacy of her father, the late Congressman Tom Lantos, who served as the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and was the only Holocaust survivor ever elected to the U.S. Congress. Congressman Lantos was the founder of the Congressional Human Rights Caucus and was widely acknowledged as one of our nation's most eloquent and forceful leaders on behalf of human rights and justice. Under her leadership, the Lantos Foundation has become a distinguished and respected voice on key human rights and also ranging from advanced rule of law <clears throat> globally and fighting for internet freedom in closed societies. She also focuses on combating the persistent and growing threat of anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial. Dr. Lanto Sweat is the former chair and vice chair of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom and teaches human rights and American foreign policy at Tufts University. She currently serves as the co-chair of the board of the Committee of Human Rights in North Korea, HRNK, and the Budapest-based Tom Lantos Institute. Dr. Sweat also serves on the advisory board of the UN Watch, the annual Anne Frank Award and Lecture, and the Warren B. Redmond Center for Justice, Leadership, and Public Policy. She is, serves as the co-chair of the International Religious Freedom Summit, which has now taken the stage as the premier uh, religious freedom gathering in the world. Also today, our moderator, as always, is Ambassador Joseph Dutrani. Ambassador Dutrani is a commentator on security issues, Formerly, Ambassador Dutrani was special envoy for six-party talks in North Korea, with North Korea and China, Russia, uh, the United States, and Japan, and South Korea. He's also the, been the director of the National Counterproliferation Center and associate director of national intelligence. And Dr. Manzroff. Dr. Alexander Manzroff is an adjunct professor for security studies at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University in Washington. He also is an adjunct professor for Korean studies at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University and at the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. I'd like to turn it over now to our moderator, Ambassador Joseph Dutrani. Thank, Thank you, you, Joe. Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well, we are honored today to have uh, Dr. Lantos Sweat to talk about human rights in North Korea. What a what a, what a, what an important issue this is. What an important subject this is. And indeed, this is the 10th anniversary of the Commission of Inquiry on, on North Korea. And uh, and and what what what, a, what an what an opportunity it is now to talk to uh, Dr. Lantos Sweat about this issue. But let me just say also uh, this past week we saw a failed uh, reconnaissance launch from uh, North Korea. But again, we're not getting into the politics of North Korea today. We're going to talk about the human rights situation in North Korea today on the 10th anniversary of the COI. Uh, and, and this is such, such an important subject. And, and indeed, just recently, our State Department put out their 2022 reports, human rights reports on North Korea. So it's come together so nicely. Dr. Lanto Sweat, over to you, and and we will then engage in uh, a very uh, a very deep uh, conversation with you about this important issue. So thank you for joining us today. 
Well, thank you, um, Ambassador Detrani. And it really is a pleasure and an honor for me to be with such a distinguished group of gentlemen. Dr. Jenkins has become a, a dear and treasured friend, but I know um, both of your remarkable background and, and uh, Dr. Matsuroff as well. And I think quite honestly, I have more to learn um, than to impart in this conversation, but it really is a matter of such importance. And I'm, I'm just grateful for this chance to discuss these issues. You know, I'm speaking to you today from my home in New Hampshire. It's a rather gray and gloomy and chilly day as I look outside the window. And I'm afraid that's a bit of an apt analogy for the situation that faces human rights in, in the Indo-Pacific region more generally, and obviously very much so in North Korea. And I'd also like to talk about China today a bit, because I think as we look at the whole Indo-Pacific region, it is China and North Korea that for different reasons pose the greatest threats and the greatest challenges. Um, I don't need to tell either of you, I certainly don't need to tell your audience that North Korea remains one of the bleakest places on the face of the earth when it comes to even the barest protections for fundamental human rights. Um, it is a totalitarian regime ruled by a quasi-religious dynasty uh, that operates a vast system of gulags um, where dissidents and really anyone who falls af afoul of the of the uh, of the brutal regime is subject to forced labor, to starvation, to torture, um, and all sorts of shocking human rights abuses, the sorts of things that were, in fact, as you pointed out, um, uh, reported on so fully in the Commission of Inquiry. Um, this is a long and a tragic history, and it is very hard in many ways to find something positive to talk about, to look for where there has been progress or where there is a hope for progress. And I actually think that if we want to, to look for glimmers of hope in what is a very difficult and a very bleak landscape, we really have to look to South Korea and not to North Korea. As you know, um, in the election last year, we a new administration came in in South Korea the, uh, with the election of Yoon suk Yeol as the new president. And this, this has enormous implications, I think, for the future of human rights in North Korea, because sadly, under the previous administration of President Moon, I don't think there can be any doubt that the, the fight for human rights was significantly downgraded um, in sort of the pursuit of unification and deconfliction strategies around the nuclear threats that are obviously front and, and center in everyone's minds. To me, one of the most alarming examples of this devaluing of, of the fight for human rights under the prior Moon administration was the decision by the Unification Ministry of South Korea to revoke the registration of a human rights group. They were, um, their name was Fighters for a Free North Korea. It was run by North Korean defectors. And this group had for many years been sending balloons filled with leaflets and in some cases, um, you know, computer hard drives, or, you know, the, the things you can stick into a computer um, into North Korea. And it was one of the few effective, very low tech, very simple means of bringing um, actual news of the outside world to the North Korean people, of breaching, if you will, the walls behind which the people of North Korea live. Um, the Unification Ministry deregistered this group, basically denying them the opportunity to engage in this work legitimacy. And this was followed up by the South Korean uh, parliament passing a law actually making this illegal making it illegal for freedom fighters, for democracy activists, for human rights activists to put leaflets into balloons and send them across the border so that people locked in this prison could, could have a glimpse of the outside world. Uh, as you can imagine, this was deeply shocking to me, particularly as the daughter of two Hungarian Holocaust survivors. 
You know, I remember growing up and hearing my parents tell the stories of how during those darkest and most um, terrifying days in Hungary, they would gather around a radio, an illegal radio, late at night, um, silently huddled around it to listen to broadcasts from the BBC and the Voice of America. And those broadcasts were to them an absolute lifeline. It brought them news of the outside world. It gave them true factual information about the progress of the war. And most importantly, it was like a little light shining in the darkness. It brought them hope in the midst of these incredibly dark times. And of course, we know that after the war, this work, this um, effort to, to bring truth to people behind the Iron Curtain was broadened. We had Radio Free Europe, we had Radio Free Asia. And um, so to me, it was stunning in a terrible way to see a democracy like South Korea actually outlaw a sort of an analogous, much simpler technology, but something analogous, an effort um, to, to circumvent the Korean Iron Curtain, the North, North Korean Iron Curtain. So from my perspective, it was an enormously welcome development when the South Korean Supreme Court just in April of this year, overturned a lower court decision that had upheld this law. Now, I am not an expert in the South Korean judicial system, but I, I, it's my understanding that there's a further review underway by the Constitutional Court, and that ultimately, to, to really do away with this law, uh, there will need to be some legislative action as well. Um, it's, it's not sort of like our American system where if the Supreme Court rules on a law, finds it invalid, it's automatically invalidated. I think there are multiple additional steps that have to take place. But at a time when there aren't a lot of victories to celebrate, this development in South Korea, coupled with a new administration that I think intends to, to reprioritize human rights and uh, and basically to be less um, less uh, single-mindedly focused on, on the nuclear threat to the detriment of all other issues relating to North Korea. And that whole other bundle of issues obviously um, lies at its very foundation, the fight for human rights. So, so this return to the status quo ante as it relates to uh, the, the lawfulness of this means of communicating with people in North Korea is, I think, a very good thing. And look, there is a reason why oppressive regimes fear truth and facts, because nothing undermines their grip on power more than the right for their citizens to seek out knowledge and truth for themselves. And that is why I feel very, very passionately that we, in the United States must redouble our efforts to break through this sort of information prisons that are holding people captive in places like North Korea. Now, when you talk about balloons, um, of course, Americans nowadays think about a very unwelcome balloon that not that many months ago was slowly traveling across our country. Um, and of course, I'm talking about the Chinese spy balloon. Uh, which was much more sophisticated than the balloons that North Korean um, dissidents are sending across the border to North Korea. Uh, but, um, you know, equipped obviously with very high-tech surveillance equipment and who knows what else. But China is obviously the other huge, huge challenge that we have to to confront as it relates to both human rights in North Korea, but in the broader Indo-Pacific and frankly in the world. China's authoritarian regime has become increasingly repressive in, East, in recent years. And last year, the re-election of Xi Jinping to another term as leader of the Communist Party has not only led to um, his personal consolidation of power, but it's been marked by the further decimation of civil society. And most importantly, a newly aggressive posture in the world 
that I think really seeks to offer an authoritarian alternative to sort of the, the rights-based system that for you know most of our lifetimes has really been led by the United States. Now, I don't think I'm saying anything that people in our audience don't know and certainly that, that my distinguished colleagues here don't know when I say that the geopolitical and moral and military challenge of our time is whether the United States and the values that we stand for, freedom, democracy, human and civil rights, freedom of religion, conscience, and belief, whether these values will continue to be the shared aspirational goals of nations around the world, or whether China's darker and more dystopian model, a dystopian model that not only doesn't seek to disrupt the abuses in a in a dark prison state like North Korea, but actually, you know, supports is North Korea's lifeline as well. Whether our vision will prevail or China's uh, China's model, which it is aggressively promoting around the world, will prevail. One of the things that causes me the greatest concern as I try to answer that question for myself is the increasing doubts that so many here have about the vitality, the vibrancy, the resilience of our own system. It is certainly one of the strengths and one of the secret weapons, if you will, of any democracy that it has the inner confidence to engage in self-criticism, that it's ready to recognize its own failures and shortcomings. That's what gives it this sort of this ability to reinvent and re-strengthen and revitalize itself to emerge from difficult periods stronger and better than it was before, to keep seeking generation after generation for that more perfect union that our constitution speaks of. And, you know, I think of, um, of my late father, Tom Lantos, who was mentioned in the introduction, the only Holocaust survivor ever to serve in the Congress. And uh, he was one of the most passionately patriotic Americans I ever had the pleasure of knowing. But my dad used to talk about something that he called the hypocrisy gap. And what he meant when he used that word was the gap that undeniably existed between the enormously inspiring and high principles that were enunciated at our founding and that are sort of in that DNA of this country, the gap between those principles and, of course, the reality. We know most, most terribly and shamefully the reality of slavery until after the Civil War. But what he would say about this hypocrisy gap, the gap between our ideals and, and sometimes the practice was that the, the magic and the beauty was of America was that generation over generation, we were on a continual process of narrowing and narrowing and closing that hypocrisy gap. And so when I speak about my concern about our own growing doubts about the resiliency and the, and the relevancy of our system um, is that, that we, we seem to me at least to have greater doubts than I can recall at any time um, in my youth. And it is one thing to of course be willing to look at one, one's own society's flaws and weaknesses in a clear-eyed way but it is quite another to begin to doubt the underlying decency and goodness of your system. And, and I think that's something we have to push back against because we are not on the brink of, we are in the midst of, I think, a very real battle for, for the future. And our, our chief adversary in this battle is undoubtedly China. China's newly aggressive posture in the world on every front, economic, cultural, and of course, military, um, is undeniable. This wolf warrior foreign policy is on display, literally on a weekly basis. We can open the Washington Times and see there on the front page the latest sort of 
uh, provocation there um, on the sea and in the air. And, um, and of course, the threats to Taiwan are real and growing. Um, and, and we need to be sure that we have a powerful and a strong strategy to counter this new challenge. I would like to suggest, and this gets back to, to North Korea and the balloons and the larger struggle we are facing. I would like to suggest that one thing we can and must do is to dramatically increase our efforts to tear down and circumvent the Great Firewall of China, the means through which it keeps hundreds of millions of Chinese locked in what I sometimes refer to as a digital prison. This is uh, an issue that the Lantos Foundation, which I am the president of, has been engaged in for many years. And the efforts and the commitment, financial and otherwise, of the United States has been woefully inadequate in this regard. You know, we know that China spends billions and billions of dollars annually to support and to sustain their great firewall and the entire surveillance state that they have built. Uh, and we have not matched, not even begun to match the magnitude of their effort. And, you know, you can always look with an authoritarian totalitarian system, where are they spending their money? What is it that they most fear? Because that tells you what their greatest vulnerability is. And they know, they see more clearly, I think, sometimes than we see, that their greatest vulnerability is, in fact, their own citizenry. Any nation not built on sort of the consent of the governed that is, is founded on the ultimately shaky foundation of repression and persecution and denial of freedom, they know that the thing they have to fear most are their own people. And uh, we are, I hope, I really hope there's new legislation in Congress, there are new initiatives that are, are underway. I hope we are on the verge of perhaps a greater and more robust commitment on the part of the United States, and I hope other um, democratically minded nations um, to finally begin funding and deploying and developing robust internet freedom technologies that can render China's great firewall irrelevant, ineffective, and ultimately obsolete. Um, I do think sort of for human rights activists like myself who try to change the world through peaceful means. You know, we don't want to see war. We don't want to see destruction. We don't want to see that kind of tragedy brought on the world. But we also know that we cannot, you know, simply say, you know, what you do in your own house is your business because that is not the foundation for a just world. And that is the kind of mindset that leaves millions of people prisoners in in really dark and dystopian places like North Korea. Um, so it is my hope that we will begin to, to really fund, develop and deploy these tools to peacefully advance the cause of democracy and human rights in, in the region of the world that I think now poses the greatest challenge and threat on these matters. You know, speaking about the power of knowledge, the power of truth, the power of individuals being to able to access that for themselves freely. freely. I'd like to, to close with, with a wonderful um, true story from another time. Um, so uh, in the 1300s, there was a, a priest and theologian and scholar by, name, by the name of John Wycliffe, who became deeply inspired by the belief that he was called to translate the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into the common vernacular so that it was something that could be read and accessed by ordinary men and women, at least those who could read. And he became the target of immense persecution by the ecclesiastical authorities of his day because this was considered a kind of heresy. They were the gatekeepers of knowledge and truth. They were the ones through whom this information could be imparted to the masses. And they viewed it as incredibly dangerous and sort of revolutionary. 
that he would try and translate Holy Scripture into the common vernacular. Despite enormous obstacles put in his path, he persisted. And when he had completed his translation of the Bible, he wrote the following words in the flyleaf of that first translation. He wrote, the translation is complete and shall make possible government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Now, to Americans, they say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We know who said government of the people, by the people, for the people. That was our own Abraham Lincoln in his immortal Gettysburg Address. But in fact, that phrase, government of the people, by the people, and for the people, has a more ancient patrimony. Now, I can't know, none of us can know exactly what Wycliffe meant when he wrote those words. But what I believe he was saying is that when people are empowered for themselves to seek truth, they also become empowered to build for themselves societies that defend and protect the rights of all people. And so as I sort of think about, about the future in what sometimes feels like a very, very bleak landscape for human rights in North Korea, in China, and in many other parts of the Indo-Pacific region, I take hope and I see that silver lining in the cloud from the fact that we can, if we have the will, deploy the technologies that will enable people in these closed societies to have that lifeline of hope, that lifeline of truth, that lifeline of accurate information that my parents had in a very dark time in another era in our history. And it is my hope that we will have the will and that we will have the confidence as a nation to continue to fight to advance human rights and justice around the globe and to, to harness the new technologies to enable us to, to tear down firewalls, tear down iron curtains, tear down digital prisons. So with that, let me stop my, my introductory remarks and I look forward to a, a wonderful conversation. Wow, that was quite something. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lanto Sweat. That was a, a very inspirational and right on the mark. You talked about North Korea and the human rights situation there. You talked about China and the Great Wall, of, uh, of keeping information out uh, to the people, empowering the people. Uh, this is a, uh, such an important subject. Uh, and I think our discussion now will just focus on exactly what you said to unpack, unpack some of the things you said, but to ask you some questions to, to get further insights from you. So yeah. I'm going to look to Dr. Mansadoff to start this uh, very important discussion. Dr. Mansadoff. Okay, thank you, Ambassador, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Katrina Sweat, uh, for your amazing presentation. I'm uh, really impressed with your absolute certitude uh, on this important issue. Uh, now, uh, I, I'm going to make two comments and then ask uh, a question, and then hopefully later, Ambassador uh, will give me a chance to uh, ask another question. Uh, but the points I'd like to make are uh, very simple. Um, you know, I always think about how do we know what we know, what we think we know. And of course, some of it comes from evidence, some of it comes, our knowledge comes from theory, uh, some comes from authority. And uh, clearly, uh, you know, I've been watching North Korea for 39 years. Next year will be my 40th year. I lived in that country for many years. You know, I visited it many, many times. And to be honest, uh, you know, I have a different picture uh, of North Korea from what you described. Uh, definitely, you know, uh, there are reports about alleged atrocities uh, in that country. Uh, most of it obviously based on uh, some secondary and tertiary sources whether it's the refugee testimonials, books written by some defectors, uh, accounts by former prison guards, uh, some media stories, hearsay, even the Commission of Inquiry report, uh, which Ambassador Detrani mentioned, is based on all of the above. 
uh, plus some images where uh, we think uh, what we see, but maybe we see something uh, which is not really there on those images. Uh, plus, of course, you need to consider a bunch of other factors like uh, the information warfare that's going on between uh, us and them, uh, the North Korean efforts of denial and deception, counter-propaganda, the echo chamber, our cognitive uh, uh, biases, etc. And so what it all comes down to, in my opinion, is yes, you know, North Korean justice system is heavily politicized. It's not really just or transparent. It's skewed to serve the interests of the ruling class uh, and the Kim family, but they're not unique in that. Uh, North Korean penitentiary system, yes, it's backward. It's dilapidated, it's uh, outcrowded, uh, basically it needs upgrades. They treat the convicts, uh, uh, you know, in a very harsh way, not necessarily humane. And there is no question, uh, again, they're not unique in that. Uh, they really don't have much interest in uh, reforming the justice system or the penitentiary system. Uh, on the other hand, of course, uh, you know, they do practice social discrimination uh, rooted in the Songbun system. Uh, you know, the religious freedom, quote unquote, is for propaganda purposes. Really, this country does not have the freedom of expression or assembly, no right to organize, no free media. Uh, but that said, all the, and I take it uh, that you're on the mark here, North Korea is not a gulag. You know, as someone whose grandparents, uh, you know, spend time actually all their lives in the gulag, uh, you know, I can't really make those comparisons, you know, with the Stalinist rule, uh, to be honest. And more importantly, I don't believe that demonizing North Korea or vilifying uh, their current leadership will do us any good in the pursuit of any policy goals uh, which we have in mind. Uh, so that's one point I want to make. The second point on the fighters uh, for free North Korea and that uh, NGO uh, which was uh, uh, discouraged from uh, doing uh, of what they were doing, flying these balloons across the border uh, with propaganda leaflets, again, demonizing uh, the North Korean regime. To be honest, uh, I believe it was a good idea for the Moon administration uh, to ban that kind of behavior. Why flying uh, balloons is a bad idea, especially in that uh, very tense area for a number of reasons. Not only because uh, it contributes to international tensions, uh, it basically violates the national sovereignty of another country, which we would not like to be done to us uh, it goes against the uh, sitting government's policy, I mean, the moon government's policy, and we don't want to have wild geese uh, chasing around. But more importantly, uh, remember, uh, these balloons can be used for spying. We don't like balloons flying over our heads. We want uh, to short them uh, down. Obviously, if you read some of the leaflets in those balloons, uh, you know, you would be really outraged by the kind of uh, messages which were uh, you know, distributed in those leaflets. I hope, you know, you get a chance to read actually one of those uh, leaflets, personal insults, uh, awful, really awful messaging. Again, this was done during the time of the pandemic. Remember how scared we were even to touch, uh, you, you know, these shopping carts uh, in our uh, shopping malls because of the threat of virus. And when you have these balloons flying over there from across the border, you know, this was an easy way uh, to spread, uh, you know, the virus, a known virus, which you don't know how to uh, confront with. We definitely would not have wanted uh, balloons to be used as bioweapon against us. And of course, uh, now looking at the battlefield in Ukraine, all these drones flying back and forth, terrorizing the population. These balloons can easily be used uh, you know, to drop explosives. Uh, and you don't know really what they carry until, you know, the explosive occurs. And so if something like this were to fly over our heads or the heads of South Koreans, 
uh, with unknown viruses, uh, you know, unknown explosives, spying devices in violation of our territorial integrity, national sovereignty, government policy, increasing tensions. I don't think you would see it as a good idea. So uh, I think uh, the Moon administration did the right thing what the current government is doing. Undoing that policy uh, will backfire in my opinion. But I promise to ask you a question. If you don't <laughs> like- have to respond to some of those things you said, but of course that's what we want. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Discussion. Alexander, now, the, hot, the, the hot potato question now is uh, President Trump's congratulation, uh, Chairman Kim, on the North Korean election uh, to the executive board of the WHO. And I am curious about your thoughts on that. Uh, but before you answer, please keep in mind that 123 countries voted yes for their decision. 13 countries abstained, 35 countries chose not to uh, come to the vote, and six countries spoiled uh, the ballot, but no single country, including the United States, voted no uh, uh, in that uh, vote. Uh, so my question to you is, was it appropriate for President Trump to congratulate uh, Chairman Kim on that, uh, considering that, again, if you are a president, you know, who uh, running for re-election and you uh, probably hope to win and want to win, uh, then you may want to try to uh, position yourself uh, for the resumption of dialogue with someone with whom you were able actually uh, to make important agreements back in 2018 in Singapore, uh, you know, imposing a moratorium uh, on the North Korean nuclear missile program. So yes, I know everybody is critical of the president uh, today for what he said, but when you look at it uh, from that perspective, as a way of maybe kind of shaping the landscape, uh, trying to position uh, the future administration for the resumption of talks uh, with North Korea, uh, is it appropriate or not? Or should we take an absolutist position, dictator is a dictator is a dictator, as you would say, and then basically uh, oh, condemn and vilify. Oh, thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you Dr. Mansurov. Over to you, please, Dr. Dr. Lantos Sweat. Well, there's so much to respond to there. Let me first begin by answering your question, and then I would like to respond to some of the other observations that you had. Um, I think it was a terrible mistake for President Trump, former President Trump, to congratulate North Korea on this because so much, so much of what happens in international geopolitics has to do with the symbolic messages that are sent. It is not simply about the behind the scenes um, sort of detailed, administrative, bureaucratic negotiations, economic treaties. It is about the big picture messages that we send. And as I tried to convey in my opening remarks, I think we really have entered now an era where once again, there is a question. There is a question being put to the world. And that question is, what, what side are you on? What future do you wanna choose for the world writ large and for your country individually? And for um, somebody who holds still enormous sway in the American political system to sort of be congratulating the leader of really what is undoubtedly one of the most repressive and brutal regimes in the world, totalitarian regimes. You are quite right, Dr. Mansurov, that, that the specific tragedies that beset North Korea, we can find them happening in many places in the world. But it is that sort of comprehensive totalitarian quasi-cult-like dynastic uh, nature of the North Korean regime, which sets it apart from other places where you can say, there are terrible prison conditions here, or, you know, these journalists have been targeted there. Yes, we, we can find bad things happening in many places in the world, but the, the, the pervasive repression 
and totalitarian nature of the North Korean regime is hard to find an equal to. And while I am sure you're right, I don't have the personal experience that you have in North Korea. And, and it's true that even while vast numbers of people may live in fear and poverty and uh, under appalling circumstances, that doesn't mean there aren't still a lot of other people who are able to live their lives with a modicum of normalcy. But it is the knowledge and the awareness of the power of the regime, of the penetration of the regime, of the threat to those who put a fingernail outside the permitted lines that has the effect of, of making that oppression almost universal in the country. So I really think you and I have a, a very different lens through which we, we see things. And, um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it was a, I think it was a bad move by President Trump. I will say, you know, I'm not a, a fan of the former president. I, I'm happy to disclose to our viewers, I'm a lifelong Democrat. And and uh, not only was my father a Democratic elected member of Congress, but my husband was as well. But I, I also try to give credit where credit is due. And one of the things that I did think had a certain amount of, um, of traction, if you will, during the pre Trump presidency was that uh, one of the tactics, if you will, that I think the North Korean regime has tended to utilize sometimes to its advantage in its dealings internationally has been to act legitimately crazy, you know, and particularly having acquired nuclear weapons, that threat of crazy actors with nuclear weapons tends to make sort of the normal and rational players in, in the room, if you will, seek to calm and accommodate those whom they perceive as acting irrationally, because the rational people don't want to provoke the irrational people to do something that might be truly dangerous for the whole world. One thing that I'll say about President Trump is, in his early dealings um, with North Korea, my sense was he was very much trying to out crazy them. And when he would say things like, yeah, you've got a button. Well, my button's bigger and much more dangerous. And I can bomb you back to the Stone Age. There was this sense in which you thought, well, maybe, of course, the North Koreans aren't actually crazy. And this is somebody who is going to say, if you want to play the crazy game, I'll out crazy you. I think things... Did, he, did, he did not continue to sort of build, if you will, on the advantage that might have given him. But um, let me stop there. I, I, I see the ambassador. Well, no, I just want, no, no, thank you. No, no, thank you, Dr. Lantos Sweat. And I thank you, Dr. Mansadoff, for your comments. I think this is an excellent discussion. I just like to weigh in with a few comments and, and, and then one or two questions for, for uh, Dr. Sweat. Uh, um, Again, thank you so much for your initial presentation, and thank you for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Uh, you know, uh, when you look at the Commission of Inquiry, uh, we're talking about 10 years, and, and Dr. Kirby did a, a pretty thorough job of talking about the, the, the dire situation, the human rights situation in North Korea. So, Dr. Mansur, if I... I, I like what you said, and you, your points I think were very important, but... Uh, what what strikes you is when you talk about uh, the food deprivation, when you talk about uh, the torture, when you talk about you mentioned the Songbong system, where the political and and indeed our State Department just came out in 2022 with a human rights report that rally is really devastating. I mean, it's talking about the issues that that uh, Dr. Sweat talked about uh, of of torture. Uh, 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 deprivation, de deprivation go going on and uh, food uh, uh, scarcity, et cetera. Uh, so, but but I, I, I do understand what uh, Dr. Mansurov was saying. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, there's a recent report that was put out by the National Institute for Public Policy. And, and uh, HRNK, its executive director, uh, and I know you're affiliated, uh, Dr. Sweat, with uh, HRNK, uh, was part of the author, uh, 
part of the uh, uh, the authors who wrote this report, and it spoke about the human rights situation in North Korea and making that the principal issue, the core issue, that the United States and, and our other colleagues, our allies in South Korea, Japan, and certainly working with China and the Russian Federation, we've always put the nuclear issue up front. So, uh, so what I'm going to say is this, uh, Dr. Sweat, uh, this report, and uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but I, I ask that our viewers take a look at it. It's put out by the National Institute for Public Policy. It was authored by uh, Ambassador Robert Joseph. And the executive director of HRNK is part of the authors who put this together. Uh, there are six authors who put this together. And it speaks to what you said, Dr. Sweat, about getting information into North Korea, empowering the people, letting the people understand what's going on in South Korea. It's not an agrarian society. It's advanced. Letting the people know it's not disinformation or misinformation. It's actual information, the truth. And you talked about Radio Free for Europe, uh, Radio Liberty. Uh, unfortunately, and, and I believe it was 1996, we did away with USIS, Information Services. I think a terrible mistake. We need to be talking about these issues and getting out there about that. So, so my question to you, Dr. Sweat, is this. Uh, I heard your comments about getting information into North Korea. I heard your comments about what you said about China, getting information there with their Great Wall, preventing information from coming in and the need for us to be more creative in getting information and empowering it. Have we, my question is, have we done ourselves a disservice by just so focusing on the denuclearization issue and not focusing on human rights? Because as a former negotiator, human rights was really not on the table. Human rights was not there. It was the complete verifiable, irreversible dismantlement of all nuclear weapons and facilities and so forth. And I think we're still on that. But I, now we're here, we're talking more about human rights. We're hearing from these, these uh, uh, defectors who come out and talk about the dire situation in the Songbun. What more should we be doing as a, as a government, as a government in, in, in focusing on human rights as the core issue, but also not making making it clear that we want North Korea to denuclearize completely verifiably. I mean, North Korea with nuclear weapons is, is a threat to the region. It's a, it's a, it's a non-proliferation threat. So how do you see our present government policy towards North Korea? And how, do you, how would you recommend we, we change that? And, and the same thing with China, with the tension we have with the People's Republic of China uh, on a lot of issues. You mentioned human rights, certainly up front. And how do you think we should be addressing that as our president, President Biden, talks about we now need to re-engage with China? What would you recommend to our government? Well, you know, I think you have brought us to one of the excruciating dilemmas about our policy vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. And that is we cannot ignore the terrifying threat that nuclear North Korea poses to the world. That is something that we can not afford to take lightly. But at the same time, we have to face the hard reality, the hard truth that over now many administrations, the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration, we have abjectly failed to stop the North Korean nuclear program. They didn't have nuclear weapons that long ago. And every single administration has made it their top priority to somewhat to the detriment of the human rights issues to, to stop North Korea from obtaining nuclear weapons. We thought we had done that. The Clinton administration thought they had done that. Um, to then, you know, trying to, to compel them to absolutely denuclearize. It has been a failure. Why has it been a failure? It has been a failure because of the nature of the North Korean regime, which I described. It is a totalitarian, brutal regime that has one imperative, and that imperative is its own survival. We 
I believe, have got to recognize that the way in which one changes regimes of that nature is by empowering the people in that country to basically destabilize their own authoritarian regime to the point where it collapses. You know, we didn't know for decades whether the great Cold War conflict between the United States and the West and the Soviet Union and all of its satellite nations would end in nuclear holocaust. It didn't end in nuclear holocaust, but it didn't end in nuclear holocaust in part because we were in there decade after decade fighting the ideological fight, fighting the fight for the hearts and minds, believing, believing passionately that what we had to offer was what their own people wanted. And in time, Hungary, the Czech Republic, you know, East Germany, they fell away. They, they could not resist the tide of freedom in their own countries. And ultimately the old Soviet Union collapsed. Now, it hasn't been, it hasn't been utopia since. And now we see Putin in his own, not communist version, but more, you know, czarist version, trying to recreate and reestablish the old Russian empire. So the battle and the struggle goes on. Francis Fukuyama got it very, very, very wrong with his brilliant essay, brilliant but wrong essay, The End of History. History is back. It's come roaring back. And the fight between freedom and, and tyranny goes on. The fight, fight between human rights and repression and, and brutal persecution goes on. And, and my answer to you is that, yes, of course, we have to continue talks. We have to continue the efforts at denuclearization. But we have made a terrible mistake, I think, by sidelining human rights. That is our greatest strength. Our rights-based system, our values-based system has been our greatest strength in the struggle against tyranny. And that's why we need to, to strengthen our system internally so that we believe again in our vision of a freer, safer, rights-based world. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Lant uh, Lantos Sweat. That was uh, outstanding. Uh, Do Dr. Mansoroff, we have a few minutes, so maybe one final comment from you and maybe I'll have a final comment also, and then look to Dr. Sweat. Excellent. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, expert of revolution is a bad idea. That's what my life in uh, the communist country taught me. Uh, it's actually a Trotskyist idea where you believe uh, that you can empower foreign people to destabilize the government. Uh, I believe unless local conditions ripe enough, you know, nothing will change. People should have the right to determine their own and they uh, need fate, the information. number one. So. Number two, uh, if we are so much worried, if we are so much, and by the way, we don't want it to backfire. We don't want anyone to interfere in our own political processes, in our own elections, in our own political struggles. But my real question to you is that if you worry so much about the free flow of information, uh, why don't we just lift the travel ban on U.S. citizens so that they can go to North Korea and see what I saw with my own eyes, you know, because you can't really, you know, make much sense if you've never been to that country. Seeing is believing. So my question to you is, what do you think about the travel ban on U.S. citizens for travel to North Korea? Should it be lifted or not? Thank well, you. my father traveled to North Korea um, tragically, there have been many Americans like Otto Warmbier for whom that proved to be a one-way ticket to their death. So I think, I think that's a complicated issue. It's a very good question, but I do agree with two things you, that you said, and that's why I believe so passionately that we need to empower people with free access to knowledge and truth. Change has to come from within. We can't export revolution, but we can empower people in their own country on their own behalf to fight for a freer and more just society. Thank you, Dr. Sweat. Let me, uh, let me comment on, the, on this um, uh, very important subject. Uh, the COI 
really goes into a great detail about the human rights situation in North Korea. Indeed, our State Department's 2000, uh, 2022 a report on the human rights situation in North Korea also goes into great detail about the dire human rights situation in North Korea. So, so uh, you know, uh, I, I think there's a, enough information out there, not only from the factors, but from other uh, sources that indicate that human rights, the human rights situation in North Korea is, is dire. There's no question. And, and, and getting information into North Korea is, 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 is always proven to be difficult. And, and, and getting people to be aware of what's happening. And then you talked about, you talked about Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia and uh, Radio Liberty and so forth, the importance of getting information in so that people understand what's going on. And I, that's why I, I highly recommend this report that was put out by the National Institute for Public Policy and HR, a, a, HRNK, talking about getting information into North Korea, empowering the people to understand what's happening there, and hopefully to, to, to encourage their leadership to say, I mean, these are, this is not, and North Korea is a Confucian society. They have an obligation to the people to ensure that there is no food insecurity, so that not over 40% of the people are malnourished. So there's a lot of responsibility there. So, so my final question, and then over to you, Dr. Sweat, is uh, what more should we be doing? You talked about a lot of things here about getting information in and, and so forth, uh, right on the mark. But uh, what would you, if you had like uh, one or two recommendations to our leadership saying, this is how we should approach North Korea right now. How would you phrase those recommendations to the leadership? And then some closing remarks from you, Dr. Sweat. Well, I, I, I will reiterate, I think a point that I've, I've tried to make thus far that I think we are at our best when we when we play to our strengths, what are our strengths as a society? It is our rights-based system. And so I would recommend to our policymakers, to Secretary of State Blinken, to President Biden, that human rights not be set aside as sort of a side issue in our dealings with North Korea, but that it be integrated in a, in a human rights, first human rights upfront way, because I think that is how we win the moral struggle that is so besetting our world now. I also think, and this is very important, that we do want and need to support the North Korean people. So, you know, when there is famine, when there is, you know, disaster of one sort or another, we want to be a partner to alleviate human suffering. But I think in in international bodies, in international venues, certainly in our own foreign policy, we need to integrate the fight for human rights into our North Korean strategy. And we cannot have a nuclear only focused strategy. I also uh, feel, I feel very strongly that we need to, to talk about the, the beauty and the um, magnificence really of Korean culture. I'm very proud to have a Korean daughter-in-law and so I have begun to, to just understand so many really magnificent things about the history and the culture of Korea. It's something I admire greatly and I think that you know it's a bit of a needle to thread. You know you, you spoke Dr. Mansurov about you know not simply you know, sort of um, delegitimizing and, and attacking a country. I think all of us at the end want the, the essential beauty of our, of our national character and culture to be acknowledged, to be respected, and to be recognized. And I think that we need to do that. Korea is one nation with a shared culture. Half of it has been brutally repressed and brutally subjugated. And you know, you see those satellite images, South Korea at night, full of light, and North Korea, an almost un unremitting black wasteland, you know, a symbol of the poverty and the darkness that still covers that wonderful country and those wonderful people. You look at the statistics, you know, the South Korean kids are 
two to three inches taller than their North Korean counterparts. This is vivid, vivid evidence that one half of a beautiful nation has been, has been subjected to tyranny and the results have been tragic. So um, in closing remarks, if, if I have one more moment, you know, I always do love to talk about my father and he endured and lived through some of the worst that humanity has ever seen, but he remained an optimist. He really did. And he would often say to me when I would despair of some situation or another, he would say, you know, my dear daughter, we're just bending what he called a windy corner of history. But around that windy corner, there will be bright skies, blue skies and wonderful opportunities. So that's my hope and prayer for the for the people of Korea. And I want to oh, thank you for this this tremendous opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Sweat. That was uh, uh, very inspirational and, 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 and very, very powerful. And your father was a, a great American. We all remember him. A uh, great American, and we, we respect everything he said and, and how he moved us forward on, on these important issues. And you continue on that march, and we thank you for doing that. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mansadoff, I want to thank you also for your comments today, and certainly to Dr. Jenkins and the Washington Times Foundation for permitting us to have discussions like this. Dr. Sweat, thank you so much. Over it's to you. It's been my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Dr. Jenkins, over to you, sir. Thank you, Ambassador Detrani and Dr. Manzroff. As always, your commentary and, and uh, questions are right on the market, stimulating discussion. And Dr. Katrina Lantosweat, this was one of our best experiences to go into uh, a very strong perspective of the value of America on our founding principles and our commitment to human rights and religious freedom. Uh, talking about the gap that your father talked about is so important because our ideals uh, are important, but putting them into practice, even now we're dealing with it in America so much in terms of respecting all people and really really going over the, the history uh, of our nation in terms of race relations, slavery. We, have, we still have a lot of work to do, but uh, with your help, uh, it's really possible to overcome many things. And I think that I learned so much today about North Korea. Um, and I've learned so much from this program. But I want to thank you sincerely, Katrina, uh, your commitment and your, your heart of care. I can see your care for people is driving this also. It's not simply a political thing at all. It's, a, it's about really liberating the suffering of other people. And ideologies and, and philosophies do matter. And I'm very uh, interested that Wycliffe was the source of, of the people, by the people, for the people. Amazing. <clears throat> the Washington Times is going to cut our program today. I'm very grateful for Chris Dolan, the president of the Times, and also uh, Mr. Guy Taylor, who's the international security team leader. Uh, they've been able to take these programs and really help to communicate these messages. And usually it's picked up by Yonhap and then it goes to Korea Times and Korean Herald. And it's really available in English and Korean to so many people. So we thank you for this program. And Katrina, you and your daughter, Chelsea, are doing such an excellent job with the Tom Lantos Foundation and with the International Religious Freedom Summit. Uh, together with uh, who you co-chair together with Ambassador Brownback. Uh, we're really, really grateful for your work. Um, also, I want to encourage everybody, we're here the first Tuesday of every month, and we always have a very outstanding thought leader, expert, and someone who really puts into practice what they, what they believe. Uh, our website that has all the past episode, episodes is WashingtonBrief.org is WashingtonBrief.org. And we will put the Institute for National Public Policy uh, uh, paper on the uh, January 23rd paper on North Korea. We will post that there on our website, along with the media uh, clips. Uh, it was very helpful today. Dr. Mansrov, you're always, uh, you're always provocative and, and thoughtful, but yeah, you do care and I've learned so much. And Joe, 
our fact finders to Korea have always been gotten the greatest attention from the key decision makers there, from the Blue House to the Foreign Ministry to uh, the Intel community. We're so grateful for that. So, uh, Katrina, I hope you have a great week, and we're Thank very, you. we're very honored to have you, and we certainly will be inviting you back soon. And I want to thank our audience. Thank you very much, uh, and may God bless you.